Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and today you've tuned into the before episode of what's shaping up to be a very interesting before and after birth journey, and we're going to talk about a great new concept in physical fitness that's taking Los Angeles by storm. My guest today has an undergraduate degree in kinesiology and a master's in exercise science. After many years working as a personal trainer, she developed her own workout concept called Bunda and is now the owner of the LA-based group fitness studio, Train Bunda. She and her husband, Kevin, also a fitness expert, are welcoming their first child in just a couple of months, and her approach to labor and delivery has changed majorly since getting pregnant. Katie Lunger lilly welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Wow, long time no see. Speak, talk. (laughs) So, I want to talk about your pregnancy and all the uh, interesting twists and turns that it's already taken and also about your workout method, but Bunda, which is just super fun to say, Bunda, Bunda. But before we get there, let's go to your background. Where are you from and how did you get started in fitness? I'm originally from Philadelphia. I moved to LA about nine years ago, almost it'll be nine years. Actually, it'll be 10 years in February. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you. So in Philadelphia, after I graduated college, I started out as a health and PE teacher for three years. And then when I moved to LA is when I got more into personal training. So you must have had an interest in health and fitness early on if you became a PE yeah. teacher. Mm-hmm. I was always interested in health and fitness and I was an athlete all my life playing softball and field hockey. Field hockey is not that known on the West Coast, but it is very popular on the East Coast. It's a popular women's sport. That was a fall sport and then softball was a spring sport. So that basically took up my life most of the Oh, that's your whole year basically. Yes. Do you train differently for both of them? Yeah, field hockey is a lot of conditioning, a lot of running. Softball, totally different. It's more strength-based agility training. And precision. Yeah. For Mm -hmm. the pitcher anyway. Yes. And what got you into those sports? Was it just your own curiosity? Yeah, I was involved in a lot of individual stuff really young, like gymnastics and ice skating. And then, you know, my dad sort of pushed me to get more involved in team sports. And that's where I really fell in love with softball. I just had a natural talent as a pitcher. I was able to throw the ball underhand, which is sort of something you either can or can't do. And then you start to critique it and perfect it. So that was my main sport. And then, you know, I played field hockey in the fall on the off time. But softball was year round for me. We used to skate. Did you consider ice hockey? Um, No, that wasn't really an option for females when I was growing up. I may have because I loved ice skating, but. I could do it now. Yeah. Well, I mean, not (laughs) right now. (laughs) I really wanted to get back into figure skating, but there's like no rink around here. Oh, my goodness. There are some rinks here. Are there? I will open your horizons. Yeah. You know, I don't skate at all. You know, I just growing up, I never did anything athletic at all. But now I regret it dearly. But my wife and I, we were married for seven years before we had kids. And so every quarter, or every half a year, each of us would pick a thing that we were going to do together. And we would just do it together. So I would always pick like, I don't know, cake making or cake decorating, just, you know, and she would yeah. be like, okay, let's go do that. It was quite fun. We make some really gorgeous cakes. And she's actually writing a cookbook right now. But she would always pick something like ice skating. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> and I would go along with them. I'm like, ah, oh, chances are they don't have a size 14 skate at the rental place. And <laughs> I'll just look like a hero for going. And we got there. I remember we were living in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we got to this ice skating rink. And I was like, size 14, please. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we have that. And so <laughs> I was like, drat. And they came out with this figure skate that was definitely meant for like an almost seven foot tall 90 pound russian figure skater girl it was super long and incredibly narrow and so i like squeezed my whole fat foot in there and i laced the thing up and as soon as i got out on the ice i was just holding onto the wall walking around and my feet were in so much pain i yeah it's painful at first yeah there was no blood going to my feet at all and so i ran off the ice you know, I didn't run. I worked my way off the ice and then I took them off and it felt so much better. And the guy said, for your foot, you need hockey skates, not figure yeah. skates. Yeah. And he said, oh, go to this place, play it against sports. You can get them used real cheap. That's and where I, I like, get my skates from. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So I was like, yeah. there's no way they're going to have size 14 and play it against sports. We walk into play it against sports in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they have a stack of brand new hockey skates, size 14 that have never been used. They couldn't sell them. Nobody wanted them. 
and they're on sale. So I got them. And then here's the end of this long winded story. We went back in there. I put on my skates. And now that I have these awesome hockey skates, people are like, wow, that guy could probably really skate. I got on the ice and my right foot slid all the way to the right and my left foot <laughs> slid all the way to the left. I essentially did one of your gymnastic splits. It was yeah. very painful, both <laughs> physically and emotionally. And I tried to get up and I crawled over to the wall. I did it two or three times and it kept happening. And then I was yeah. halfway across the okay. ice and I didn't know which was the faster way to get back. And this whole class of like six and seven year olds came on the ice zipping around for a school trip. <laughs> and I was literally crawling across the middle to get off the ice. And these kids were walking up to me like, you okay, mister? I'm like, get out of here. Beat it. Scram. <laughs> and then the guy told me, he goes, of course you can't skate in those. They've never been sharpened. Oh, wow. I didn't know you have to sharpen skates yeah, before you have to you're sharpen skating. Skates He's like, they lot, can't yeah. grab the ice. I'm like, you're telling yeah. me. <laughs> so I don't know. I didn't go back. But ice hockey does look kind of cool. Yeah. I'll hook you up with some rinks. Awesome. And then you taught high school PE, which yeah. when I was in high school, PE was not serious at all, sadly. Yeah, it's, it hasn't gotten really that much better, unfortunately. I wish it would, but that's kind of why I got out of teaching. I mean, I liked it. I, li I loved the kids, most of them. <laughs> but yeah, it just sort of, when you're health and PE, people think, well, one, you don't really get that much respect from the teachers because you don't have to do lesson planning and things like that. And you get to wear sweatpants to work. So people definitely resent that. But you feel like you're a babysitter and you're just sort of like rolling the ball out to the kids that show up. And a lot of kids get excused for whatever reason. And it's not as fulfilling as I would have hoped it would have been. You yeah, know? you're in it because you're passionate about health and yeah. fitness. Yeah. And everyone else is just sort of like exactly. you know, dumping on it. But at yeah. least you get that whistle. The whistle is cool. Yes. Yeah, the whistle is cool. <laughs> Uh, you trained for six years at a gym that became an Equinox. So it's a, yeah. it's a nice gym. How is training people yeah, at a nice Equinox, gym? Yeah, Equinox um, is an amazing gym. It's really high end. You know, if you're able to be hired as a trainer there, uh, like, it's great. You have access to a lot of high end clientele, meaning that they can afford to pay for the personal training prices. And then, you know, you can build your book of business and then it becomes all referral based. So it's a hustle in the beginning. You know, I remember when I first started out, I would just set up like a little table and offer free training sessions. And you have to do a lot of those to get a client from. But once you build your book, then you're set and you're basically based off of referral. And it's an amazing place to work. I climbed the ladder as a trainer there and became a tier four, what's called a tier X trainer now. And that's just their top level trainer. And they put you through this entire program. It's almost like a half semester of like a college where, you know, it's Thursday through Sunday of education. And it's some of the most cutting edge education in fitness right now. So out of everything I've done, my master's degree, I have a high end, like certified strength and conditioning specialist degree, like the Equinox education was, you know, just as good, if not better. I always feel like I have a lot of tears with my trainer. Yeah. Do, do <laughs> you still do personal training at all? I don't know. I miss it, but I kind of decided to get into group and, you know, having your own business, you sort of have to make sure that you can keep your focus where it should be. And, you know, I knew I wanted to open Boonda and I felt like even being, I worked at Equinox so as a part of a team of trainers at that point, like when I felt like I wasn't giving a hundred percent anymore and like I was starting to focus too much on Boonda, I was like, all right, it's time for me to leave. I'm somebody that I have to give a hundred percent of whatever I'm doing. And I can't, to my own personal training clients do that if I'm running a gym, especially so right now. Boonda's your first baby. Yes. What is the concept? How'd you come up with it? What does it mean? Yeah, Boonda, really fun to say, like you said. Bunda. It means butt in Portuguese. So I'm not Portuguese. I don't have Portuguese background. I just spent some time in Brazil and I learned the word because especially in Brazil, women love training their butts <laughs> and they lift heavy weights. <laughs> so the word bunda, I was like, I love this. And I knew I wanted to open a gym that was based around glute training. And the reason for that is some people are like, oh, I already have a good butt. Like, that's not the point. The point is, is like, if you train your butt and legs a lot, it's so metabolic, it'll change your whole body. So, you know, the first result people see when they come to bunda consistently is the change in their stomach, in their core. Mm. Um, in the waistline, it takes a while to see results in the glutes, you know, you're not going to see it right away. But um, the class is half Stairmaster, that's a cardio portion. And then the other half of the class is weight training. So we focus on progression, you know, strength training, lifting heavier. I am definitely a firm believer of heavy weight training. Uh, I can promise any woman that it will not get you bulky, no matter what myth you've heard. And it's really effective. And how long is the class? It's 50 minutes. 5 -0? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. that's a long. <laughs> Are there different fitness levels? There's different fitness levels, but we don't have like a beginner, intermediate, and advanced class. Right now, everybody's in the same class. 
and it works well. You know, you, you could be brand new and next to somebody that's done a hundred classes before. And as long as you can listen to the instructor and take the progression that's right for you, meaning maybe you're not grabbing the heaviest weights in the room, but maybe the person next to you because they've been to that hundred classes is, but you're going body weight you'll be able to see really, really good results. And then you'll be able to lift those really heavy dumbbells in, you know, a couple months. I thought if you had beginner, intermediate, and advanced, it'd be like the tofu. It would be yeah. like <laughs> soft, semi-firm, super And firm. then hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is this something you could do during pregnancy? It is. Yeah. We have a lot of clients that come in that are pregnant and it's great for them. The good thing about the Stairmaster itself is that it is really metabolic, but it's low impact, provided you're not going super fast. Anything that you start going really fast is going to become more impactful. But that's my first recommendation for anyone that's pregnant is just bring the level down. You know, the only thing I would say to not recommend is that if you've never been on the Stairmaster before, or you're not really into a fitness program right now, and then you get pregnant and you want to start going around a group and start on the Stairmaster, I would be a little wary of that. I mean, not that you can hurt the baby, but you know, your body is changing and you can get hurt. Yeah. It seems like it'd be a great postpartum workout. Yes. It's an amazing postpartum workout. And one of the main reasons for that is just because we do focus a lot on the core and I don't mean isolated ab training because a lot of isolated ab training is a lot of flexion extension of the trunk. And that's what is not great when the abdomen splits or is close to splitting. That happens to a lot of women in pregnancy on that diastasis recti that, you know, takes a while to sort of repair itself and it can be repaired provided you're doing the right exercises. So our core stabilization work is done more through lower body training, how to embrace your core, your pelvic floor muscle, not so much just doing abs. Sounds great. Do you yeah. have classes like all through the day, morning? And yeah. So prior to our second shutdown, we're running like nine classes a day. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. A, all day long. Yeah. And shutdown because right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, and yeah. so yeah. here in California, <laughs> gyms are not allowed to be open indoors. So everyone's got to get a little creative. Yes. So do you train other Bunda instructors? Yes. So one of the things that separates Bunda from other group fitness studios is that we do require each instructor have a certified personal training cert. And that just gives a lot of, you know, comfort for me. I do all the programming. So no matter what instructor is teaching, it is done and programmed by me and our management team. Of course, I'm open to creativity and suggestions from my instructors, but I want people to know that there is science backing behind the program that we're not just like going off the cuff and going, you're doing this next or this next. It's thoughtfully planned out. And anyone that's a trainer really respects that and understands that side of the programming aspect. And they can also just keep an eye on the room because the main reason why I got into group fitness is because I feel like people love groups so much, but there's so many times where no one in the room is doing the exercise right. Mm -hmm. And you can get hurt, obviously. And then also, it's really hard to see results if you're not doing, if you're not doing it right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, congratulations on opening Thank it. You. I would like to get a lot more personal about you and your pregnancy and your yes. plans for birth. We're going to take yeah. a quick break. And we will be right back with Katie Lunger, Lily. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We are talking to Katie Lunger, Lily. You're prego. Yes, yeah. You're like two months left to go, mm -hmm. and your birth journey has been pretty interesting so far. Your husband, by the way, is also in fitness, right? Yes, he is. He's co-owner of Bunda, and then he also has his own personal training studio. It's called Heart and Hustle. So this baby is going to be a fit baby. Yeah, no choice. Yeah. My kids love food. Your kids are going to love fitness. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they um, love food too. We do love food. I know. We <laughs> definitely did our best to get them much more involved in fitness. And my wife works out a lot. And so she makes us all go hiking all That's the good. time. Yeah. And stuff no, like just that. maintaining a healthy balance. That's what it's all about. My kids, they each have their thing. My son played baseball. My daughter played basketball. My other daughter, she loves horseback running and she goes all the oh, time. Oh, yeah which is kind of a workout too. Yeah. And then my youngest just loves video games, but we're working on him. <laughs> How was your first trimester? It wasn't great, to be honest. I was really nauseous. I wasn't actually physically getting sick. I know some women like uncontrollably are growing up that that did not happen to me, thankfully. But when you're someone that is used to feeling like really good every day, and then all of a sudden I was so tired and really really nauseous like certain smells like to me i would vomit like oh really 
Yeah, it was bad. And it was kind of depressing in the beginning. Like I didn't feel that happy. I mean, obviously I was happy to be pregnant, but sometimes I feel like it's not talked about that much. Like when you're really, really not feeling good, it's like not great. Yeah, I just see the strongest, healthiest, most glowing people sometimes in that first trimester, they just look like my cell phone on its last bar. Yeah, know? literally. I mean, I was trying to push myself through workouts, which looking back on it, I wish I would have just not done it at all. It wasn't even worth it. My body was just not having it. I'm not somebody that ever takes naps. I just have never loved it. But I spent the most time in bed that I ever have in the first trimester. And sort of like a silver lining to the pandemic, as horrible as it is, gyms got shut down around the time yes. you got knocked up. So yeah, exactly. So if any good came out of that, it was the fact that I was not getting up at 4.30 a.m. I've been working till 9 p.m. What time is your <laughs> yeah, first class? Our first class is at 6. So so anywhere oh, wow. from 4 30 and 5 and then you know we finish classes at 8 15 p.m or 8 30 p.m and then by the time you're home and eating it's nine wow. so that would have had to have changed either way because i know pregnant you need sleep and rest but um that was like you said like a little bit of a silver lining in the three months that we weren't open i was really able to focus on myself and get some rest Okay. I know that because we've talked about this before you got pregnant, mm -hmm. you had very specific thoughts on how this baby was going to come out of you. Yeah. I was always someone that was set on having a C-section. I wanted nothing to do with giving birth vaginally. I just really didn't want anything to do with it. I think I was just really terrified of labor. I mean, and I've never seen a labor video or anything like that. It's just, you hear people talk about it like it's the worst thing in the world. You see it on movies and I'm sure it's obviously exaggerated, but it does have an effect on you. And I feel like for me, I would even be willing to be put to sleep, like put me to sleep during the cesarean and like, I'll hold my baby later. Like, <laughs> like um, remove me from the equation yeah, as exactly. much as possible. Yeah. You do yeah. this for me. It's kind yeah. of interesting. I've talked about this in the past, but it's sort of like all the information that women often get about labor and delivery comes from TV movies and newspaper mm -hmm. headlines. Yeah. And so the analogy I've used in the past is like, if you're 30 years old and you've never been on an airplane before mm -hmm. and the only things you know about airplanes are what you've seen in tv movies and newspaper headlines you'd be terrified exactly to fly in an airplane like the assumption is that every airplane is either going to have engine failure and fall out mm -hmm. of the sky or be hijacked by terrorists or have snakes on it like yes. those are yeah. the only things you know because that's Very all you good. ever saw the idea yeah. of an airplane just taking off having a great flight with a cool snack and then landing uh -huh. is totally foreign yes and that's what we've done to childbirth is TV, movies, and newspaper headlines, you're never going to see a headline that says, oh, all the planes landed safely today. It's always exactly. about the one in a million that crashes or something terrible happens to it. And that's the same for childbirth. It's over-dramatized in TV and movies. And mm -hmm. nobody wants to just see a great birth that goes well on TV, you know? And it's the same thing for the stories. You only hear the really dramatic stories. But yeah. in truth, many, many women are just having amazing experiences in childbirth, and you never hear about that. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't be more like, spot on with that. And that's why I started reading this book by Ina May. I mean, she was like a midwife for years. And she wrote a book, I think it's called A Guide to, to Childbirth. Childbirth. Yeah. yeah. And it just completely changed my perspective on having a baby. And just that women have been doing this for centuries. And a lot of times you're made felt like your body wasn't designed to do this and you need some sort of medical intervention when really you don't. I know there are certain times where it's absolutely needed. And I'm thankful that we have a lot of medical advancements that women did not have access to centuries ago. So they would literally die during childbirth, whereas now it's much more rare. But for me, I just think reading this book really opened my eyes to the fact that being a woman and having this human grow inside of you is amazing. And then why would I want to completely remove myself from the process of giving birth to my baby like I wanted to in the beginning? I don't know if you've listened to the Hillary Duff episodes of our podcast, but... Yeah, I actually have, yeah. Oh, it's kind of interesting. After her first birth, where she was awake, but she was mm -hmm. medicated, and she had a good experience with it, it's just the five years after that where she was with her son that she realized the most meaningful moments to her when she's most present with her son and she just had this thought when she was pregnant the second time what if the most present thing i could do with my child is childbirth labor and delivery right. 
but I'm afraid of it. So I'm yes. numbing myself to the whole process. Sounds exactly. like you're having like a similar journey, but you had fear. Were you afraid of the labor, the contractions? Yeah, I can't say that I know what a contraction feels like. I've never had a baby before, but I will say that what scares me more is more of the medical intervention, the needle in my back, the losing feeling from the chest down from a cesarean section like those things scare me a lot more than somebody being like no the contractions are going to be extremely painful now i know a lot of women if you say that too they'll be like yeah just wait until you're in a contraction (laughs) you're going to want the needle in your back but i'm saying what scares me when i started to think about okay what am i actually really afraid of those are the things that scare me more like i'm much more afraid of that i'm the kind of person like I will ask a ton of questions, like I'm afraid of the headache from the epidural, I'm afraid of my nerve damage, I'm afraid of side being paralyzed. Yeah, unwanted side effects and, yes. and risk. But you could have ended up in a situation because you were afraid previously of giving mm-hmm. birth vaginally or even being awake for birth. So you could have ended up in a situation where you were terrified of both. Yes. But you haven't, you've sort of like transitioned. No, I think honestly, like this book has really helped me sort of accept that it is happening. I mean, she just really talks about how in the modern day world makes women really, really afraid of birth, like you talked about earlier. And if you really just start to think of it and accept it as being present, it's like the female version of just climbing Mount Everest. Like this is your time to really perform. You know, some people climb Mount Everest and they pay to climb Mount Everest and they suffer climbing Mount Everest. I mean, they really push their mind and body through some harsh elements and they love it and they're proud of it. But, you know, you have to really have your eye on the prize and be driven and motivated and know what's pushing you through those stages. Yeah. Sometimes childbirth is similar. Yeah. I mean, I don't anticipate it being easy, but instead of going into it extremely, extremely scared, I am going into it a little bit more excited and I would say anxious. Like I do really want to try to do this, you know, without an epidural and not for any other reason, just other than that, I feel more comfortable not having the drug intervention Mm -hmm. now that I've read and sort of educated myself on what I'm comfortable with and what's not. At this point, have you now seen a video of a birth? Or no, I haven't. I, have, I probably should. <laughs> Are you open to the idea or does it make you nervous? Yes. Uh, yeah, I would watch one now. Okay. I'll show you one next time you're in the office. Yes. <laughs> I have some really cool ones, actually, from documentaries that we shot and some that we used and some that we haven't used yet. But I would also say maybe a good one to watch for you and for listeners is this elephant birth, which I also showed Hillary Duff. She said it was really empowering and other people have said that too it's on an elephant reserve in bali and the elephant her name is risky and it's called risky business if you search youtube and it's just amazing she kind of goes off from the path by herself and she labors by herself and she just seems to know exactly what to do and they don't intervene at all they just watch her do it and she labors and she delivers and she turns around and she does all the neonatal care for the baby the baby right away comes out not exactly uh, breathing and she knows something's wrong and she does all these interventions and she never went to medical school there's no doctor midwife doula nurse she hasn't read a book as far as i can tell she hasn't listened to a podcast seen any documentaries but she knows exactly what to do. It's clear that that wisdom, that innate knowledge is hardwired into you, into women. Yeah. Um, and if you don't think about it too much rationally, like your body will know exactly what to do. Yeah, it's not just human females, it's every female on the planet. Gives exactly, birth. yeah. But, you know, the benefit for her is that she hasn't really seen any TV movies exactly. or <laughs> hardly reads the paper. Yeah. Well, let's take a break and come back and find out how your later stages of pregnancy have been and okay. what you're planning now for yes. your birth. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Katie Lunger Lilly. All right, so the first trimester, not your favorite. No. How is two and three? Um, the second trimester, I started to feel a lot better. I had a lot more energy and I started to get more hungry. To be honest with you, my appetite seemed bigger not being pregnant. Like I find myself just really not that hungry. Just now, like I just got into my third trimester feeling like more hungry than normal. But the second trimester, I wasn't nauseous, but people are like, what are you craving? I wasn't craving that much. Hmm. I craved like watermelon, which is weird, but. Oh, 
Your yeah. energy went up and your workouts came back? My energy went up. I can't say that my workouts came back like they were prior to being pregnant. You know, some women I've seen and I've trained and they can progress during pregnancy. They can lift heavier. I haven't had that experience. I have had to pull back and I just came off having an injury. As you know, like mm-hmm. I really hurt my back. I think exercise induced and then pregnancy didn't really help it. And I, I had to rest it for like three weeks. So for me... I've had to really pull back on my workouts. I mean, I'm still active, but it's definitely not the same. I'm just curious because you've been fit your whole life, super yeah. fit, and you have a fitness program. It's Bunda, so it's mm-hmm. like butt and core stuff. Yeah. How are the pregnancy changes for you? So first of all, just the natural changes in body that happen during pregnancy. Yeah. But especially since you haven't been able to work out as much as you're used um, to. It's definitely hard, especially in the very beginning where, you know, you're pregnant, but no one knows and you look like you just sort of gained weight. So I remember after finding out I was pregnant, I think I'd already gained weight. I put on 10 pounds like immediately. It said, I Googled in your first trimester, you're supposed to gain like one to four pounds. By the end of my first trimester, I gained like 16 pounds and I wasn't even eating that much. I just think like when you're really involved in fitness or you're really fit, there's so much blood volume, water weight that your body sort of just adds right away and it puts weight on you. So as someone that is very aware of their body, like I can feel myself ovulate when I was ovulating. And so when you're aware of every single change, it is really different, especially, you know, I've been able to maintain my weight and my body fat percentage for literally years now. And then all of a sudden having it completely change is hard to accept. You know, I'm now at the point where it's happening and I realize it and I'll take on the challenge of getting myself back to where I was postpartum. Is there some part of you that looks at your body and your bump and is proud of it? Like you're... Yeah, I think so now. In the beginning, to be honest, no. (laughs) I mean, some people never do. Some people just hate it and feel fat and other things Yeah, no, I mean, I can't say I love being pregnant. You know, some women are like, I love it. It's amazing. Um... But I definitely feel connection to my baby. I do. And sometimes when women would say that prior to me being pregnant, I'd be like, how is that even possible? And now I'm like, I can't believe I even judged that because I totally feel connected to her. But in terms of the symptoms and the body changes, no, I, I don't love it. But I'm fine with my bump now. Now it's a real bump. People know that you're pregnant. They don't just think you've gained 15 pounds in the quarantine stage of the pandemic. (laughs) Well, I think it's kind of the opposite for you because you're so fit everywhere and you just have a bump. It kind of looks like you swallowed a bump (laughs) and you don't really look pregnant anyplace else. So there's zero mistaking that you're, (laughs) you're with child. Now that your birth plan has changed, your (laughs) perspective on birth has changed. Are you settled on your ultimate plan? Um, I haven't settled on it, but I think it's a challenging time right now. I think for any woman to give birth, especially in a hospital, just because we are dealing with the pandemic and there's a lot of rules, you know, I've been reading and it says, you know, if you are trying to do this naturally without drug intervention, that a doula would really help. And the issue is, is right now you can't bring a doula into the hospital. You can barely bring your husband. Mm -hmm. So we had talked about laboring as long at home as you possibly can and then going to the hospital. I think what scares me a little bit about that is just that I don't know what to expect. So if I feel a contraction that I feel is like the worst thing ever, but maybe just be like, maybe I'm, you know, two centimeters dilated or whatever it is, but I think I'm eight cent, you know, it's like, how do you know when you've been laboring for long enough where you should go to the hospital and when you shouldn't like, I guess that part is not clear to me right now. You know, uh, several of our patients, several, who have the same issue, like they want a more natural, uninterventive birth, Mm -hmm. but they were planning to bring a doula. The hospital you're giving birth at used to not care how many people you brought in. So you could have your doula, a family member, a other support person, a photographer. I used to go all the time and support people with body work and labor. They just didn't care at all. But now, like you said, it's just one support person, which is your partner. They have a role that nobody else could fill, but he's probably never been to a birth before either. And so it's whichever labor and delivery nurse they put with you, which could be an amazing nurse or not an amazing nurse, or a good fit for you or not a great fit for you. Can you change them out? You pretty much can, actually. If it's not a good fit for you, it's probably not a good fit for them. And it would be nice if you could each switch and get somebody better. They're pretty good about it. That hospital has a lot of nurses at all times. So as long as they're not completely overloaded, you probably could. But also your nurse is sometimes just managing your birth and sometimes two or three births at a time. So no one was in there with you. And now in the hospital, you have to wear a mask pretty much the entire time you're in labor and you can't leave your room. And your partner can't even leave and come back. Once they're there, everybody has to stay. 
So there's a lot going on that makes it harder to do natural childbirth in a hospital setting. And so a lot of our patients, what they've done either is switch to home birth. I would say not people who never imagined the concept of home birth. Right. There's more people who said like, okay, maybe for the second baby, or maybe I'm 60, 40 in favor of hospital, but then switch to 60 and 40 in favor of home after they met with a midwife or did some other research. Or another thing that seems to be pretty popular right now is laboring at home as long as you can with a midwife acting as a mm-hmm. monotrice. So that it's those things that you said, like, is this normal or not normal? How far along am I? Again, I think like the elephant, if you closed your eyes and just got in tune with your body, you'd probably know. Right, right. But it's nice to have for humans, especially with that conscious mind running and doing all this analysis and assuming the worst all the time. It's nice to have a professional there who can monitor the baby, listen to the heart rate, make sure the baby's happy as a clam, monitor your vital signs, make sure your body's handling labor very well, support you, help you understand, monitor your cervix, how far along you are if you want that, and to also support you in ways that can help get you more comfortable physically or emotionally or help things progress if there's anything holding it up. And then when you're ready or want to or need to, then you go to the hospital. But I think I told you this earlier today that I've had a few people interview midwives to become their monitrees and then they just said, "Uh, screw it, we're going to just do home birth. Yeah, yeah. They fall in love with the idea. Yeah, I will say like prior to being pregnant, I thought home birth was like something that only hippies did. It was something completely different. Like I totally understand why people do it. I 100% get it. I feel like we talked about it today. I'm still like, I love my doctor. And I think for my first child, I would be a little bit more comfortable in a hospital setting when I finally deliver the baby. But I think like for my second child, I would definitely be open to the concept of doing it all at home. Mm -hmm. Well, are you open to the idea of laboring at home with a midwife? Well, yeah. Time will tell. This is why your after episode will be so interesting because yeah, you're, you're still yeah. not 100% settled. You're still on the journey. Yes. I realized, like we talked about, I've now flipped to really not wanting a C-section. However, I do realize that there are certain times where it has to happen. So I don't want to completely set myself up for convincing myself that I'm not doing that and then end up half to doing it and freaking out about that. Yeah. I mean, the idea of a birth plan in my mind is you kind of set your sights on the most natural birth that you yourself envision wanting to possibly have. Yeah. Right. And that's page one of your birth plan. For some people that's at home or with a midwife or with a doctor at home or just by yourself at home. Other people it's at a birth center or in the hospital with a doctor, with meds, without meds, surgically, medically, knocked out totally. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's page one of your birth plan, but there's always a flow chart that if this happens or that happens, mm-hmm. then we'll go down the flow chart with this intervention or that intervention. And so the end of the flow chart, even at a home birth, is going to the hospital and is having a cesarean. Because if you need one, of course you're, you're gonna yeah. have one. But it's still the question is like what's page one is page one starting off at home and maybe staying there or is page one just laboring at home with a professional and then wanting to go to the hospital or just going to the hospital early with your partner and toughing it out together you know Um, to be determined we're not quite there yet it sounds like yeah no I'm I'm not quite there yet I feel like I ideally would want to labor at home for as long as possible but I do know that I will need someone here to assure me that everything is fine because I have no idea what to expect. Right. Like I said, if I have my first contraction, I may think I'm having the baby in five minutes when yeah. <laughs> it could literally be 36 hours, you know? So <laughs> it's interesting. But I mean, you are, despite scaling back your workouts, you're super fit still. <laughs> and I just think you have like a relaxed mind. Like pain doesn't seem to be such an inhibitor for you. Like you can take intensity for a good cause. Especially when I know there's breaks in it, which also that book talks about. It's like no one talks about the breaks during the contractions, which are amazing. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, most people have them, right? So you feel intensity (laughs) for 40 seconds and then a break or a minute and then a break. And, you know, I think that sometimes when you're pushing yourself in terms of fitness classes or personal training, you do put yourself through intensity that you have to overcome mentally, but you know Mm -hmm. it's for a good cause. So you like push through and then you get your break and you do another set. So it'll be interesting to see, but I think that pain is not your thing. It's more a fear of like what's supposed to happen and what is happening or is this normal or not? And that's a lot of fear of the unknown. I think we all have that. Yes. All right. I'm excited and curious to see where this goes. Yeah, me too. I love the journey that you've been on already. 
and I'm honored to play a small part in it. Yeah, uh, thank you. In the meantime, where can we find you online? For Boonda, it's trainboonda.com. And then our Instagram is at trainboonda. At trainboonda. Did somebody already have trainboonda? So someone, uh, for trainboonda, if you just type in boonda on Instagram, it's like a lot of butts. So oh, okay. boonda makes it more of like a gym. <laughs> I see it. Okay. At trainboonda, B-U-N-D-A. Very interesting to check out. Are there online classes? Right now, yeah. So one of the good things coming out of this pandemic is that we'll continue to do it. So right now we offer daily Zooms and they're $10 each, but you get access to them for 24 hours. So even if you can't sign up, let's say the sign up is 1030 class, but if you sign up for 1030 class and you're not able to actually attend at 1030, yeah, for 24 hours. And we'll keep that up every day, even after we reopen, because I know there's a lot of people immune compromised or people that are not going to be comfortable coming to the gym. So we want to be able to. And also uh, with the listeners all over the country, actually all over the world. So now we can make your unique fitness program available to everybody. Yes, exactly. That's the goal. Amazing. Katie, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank for you. sharing your inspirational take on fitness. You make it look easy, which <laughs> makes me mad, but it also makes me want to give it a try. It does get easier. You just have to get started. Tell me that every time you see me one time <laughs> and hopefully I'll get started. Actually, since I had COVID and I came home from the hospital, I've been doing more general fitness, like getting on the treadmill. That's um, good. Regularly. Even just going for walks, just moving is exercise. And it does feel good. Like even just doing it like two or three days in a row and it's like, whoa, totally different feeling. So yeah, I see wisdom in your words of wisdom. Just getting started is difficult. Once you do it, it feels a lot better. Yeah. Uh, next time we talk to you, you will have a baby in your hands. Yes. <laughs> and we'll see how the journey went. Thanks yes. so much for joining me at home. Thanks for listening. For more pregnancy and parenting information, visit us online at informedpregnancy.com. <laughs>